successful underwater firing of this Polaris test vehicle in July 1960 is the culminating event in a series of breakthroughs arming America with a powerful new deterrent weapon in record-breaking time. The missile is the Polaris, assured of reaching target and carrying in its powerful warhead immense potential for preserving world peace. This is the nuclear-powered United States submarine George Washington, first of America's fast-growing fleet of undersea missile launching platforms, whose speed and endurance bring all the oceans of the world within her theater of operations. The planet Earth should be called the planet sea for 71% of its surface is covered by water. A great unbroken expanse of sea completely surrounding the island continents inhabited by man. With literally millions of cubic miles of ocean for concealment, our atomic powered submarines armed with Polaris missiles can threaten any military target on Earth with certain destruction, thus deterring any aggressor nation from starting a nuclear war. This combination of worldwide undersea navigation and outer space missilery is embodied in the Navy's Fleet Ballistic Missile Weapons System. Most of you here today are concerned in one way or another with the management of large-scale research and development programs. You can therefore appreciate the problems that Navy faced in the development and management of the FBM weapons system. It was an undertaking of enormous dimensions and technical complexity. About 400 major projects would have to be carried out in virtually every scientific field. In mathematics, in chemistry, in physics, and many others. An extensive big-scale research and development effort in many areas completely outside the existing state of the art. A full-scale research and development program would have to be carried out in the field of inertial navigation, for example to guarantee precise underwater ship movement and pinpoint positioning in any ocean of the world. Further large-scale research and development would be needed for the creation of a fire control system of exceptional precision and advanced design, for the development of complicated systems of electronic navigation equipment, for the perfection of checkout and readiness equipment of maximum reliability and high precision. In addition to these problems of submarine construction, creation of the Polaris missile would also require large-scale research and development effort. Polaris was to be a new departure in missilery, a solid-fueled underwater to outer space ballistic projectile developed progressively through flight test vehicles such as this. R&D would be required for the development of powerful, safe, solid propellant fuels. For the creation and perfection of never-before-tried missile launching systems. For the design, development, production and assembly of more than a quarter of a million interrelated, interacting components and parts. Seldom had peacetime America tackled a job of such complexity and scope. Thousands of industrial organizations, government agencies, and educational institutions would ultimately be involved. Here was a problem big enough to tax not only the technical and management capabilities of the Navy, but of thousands of cooperating industrial team members as well. 
To coordinate and control this complex research and development program, Navy created the Special Projects Office in November 1955. Its mission, to bring the fleet ballistic missile concept into tactical capability on the tightest time schedule possible. With the Special Projects Office as overall weapon system manager, the availability of operational Polaris submarines equipped with tactical missiles has been advanced by more than two years. Nuclear-powered submarines have been launched and christened at regular intervals. The first was the USS George Washington, coming down the ways in June of 1959. Three months later, the USS Patrick Henry followed, increasing our subsea ballistic missile fleet and expanding our war deterrent strength. In October, another Polaris missile launching platform took to the sea, the USS Theodore Roosevelt christened and launched at the Mare Island Naval Shipyard. By year's end 1959, the Polaris fleet had grown to four with the launching of the Robert E. Lee, another powerful unit in America's growing subsea missile capability. Progress continued in 1960. In May, the USS Abraham Lincoln joined our Polaris submarine fleet. Progress in development of the missile was equally successful. An early milestone of progress was Operation Pea Shooter. Soon followed by Operation Sky Catch to test the new launching system and explore new methods of missile ejection. Underwater launchings were next in the chain of progress. Operation Pop-Up, a series of tests from a submarine-type launcher off San Clemente Island, California. As test objectives were successfully met, a fishhook superstructure was added to catch and save the instrumented vehicles under test. In 1959, a significant breakthrough occurred. This was the launching of a Polaris test vehicle from Navy's weapon test ship, the USS Observation Island. During late 1959 and early 1960, a series of successful land-based test firings made headline news across the nation. In April 1960, another milestone was reached. A highly successful test vehicle firing that proved Polaris' ability to make the transition from underwater launch to powered, instrumented flight. Navy's Polaris missile was clearly approaching operational status. And in July 1960, with the successful firing of a Polaris test vehicle from the USS George Washington, the climax objective of the fleet ballistic missile development effort was achieved. With this historic event, the concept of Navy's FBM weapon system became reality more than two years ahead of schedule. Credit for this impressive achievement is shared by all members of the FBM weapon system development team by the various agencies of the United States government that participated, by the universities and institutions of higher learning who cooperated, and by American industry, whose genius for invention and capacity for production were found to be as great in peacetime as in time of war. Credit is deserved also by Navy Special Projects Office for directing this vital project to completion in record time, and in the process, 
creating new management tools for big-scale R&D program control. Immediately after its establishment, SP conducted a survey of all management systems then being used by government and by industry. For example, the line of balance technique was found to work well as a production control tool, but the system was not completely adaptable to the uncertainties found in complex research and development programs. To supplement line of balance, SP developed its program management and milestone reporting technique. This system was found to work well and was soon put to use by other government agencies and many private industries. But as the FBM program gained momentum, an urgent need developed for a more responsive technique. To meet this need, Navy established an operations research team, and within a few months, a new management technique called PERT was evolved. PERT stands for Program Evaluation and Review Technique, a fast, flexible management control tool for coordinating complex research and development programs. PERT's basic document and symbol is a program network. A network is an orderly sequence of activities and events as they must be carried out under current planning to accomplish the program's end objective by a specified target date. When a network is prepared initially, you set it up in reverse. That is, you begin with the end event and work backward through all the significant preceding events to time now. This reverse procedure is to make sure that every event represents an accomplishment absolutely necessary to achieve the end objective. Events identified both by number and by description are progress milestones leading to completion of the program. The PERT system requires that the completion of every event be clearly recognizable at a specific instant of time. For example, the completion of this event, begin design study, takes place at an identifiable moment of time. The arrows that link events together represent the work or activities that have to be carried out between events. This arrow or line therefore represents the design study activity that has to be carried out between begin design study and finish design study. So through interrelated activities and events, the PERT network leads to the end event. The activities and events of a modern research and development program are very diversified. Therefore, to be effective, a management system must take into consideration not only physical activities, but administrative activities and events as well. Such intangible but nevertheless vital events as decisions. Decisions of many kinds management decisions, technical decisions, administrative decisions. In addition, an efficient management system must coordinate and control all production activities and events. Fabrication progress. Assembly progress. Component testing. In short, every significant activity or event that can be stated in terms of time. The PERT system requires that three time estimates be given for each network activity. To understand why, let's examine this activity arrow or line. Network arrows, as we have seen, represent the elapsed time required to complete the work between program events. First, the technician in charge of the work estimates the most likely time in weeks the activity would take if repeated a hundred times under the same conditions, say, 12 weeks. Then he estimates an optimistic time, one that might be achieved once or twice in a hundred tries with good luck, but without unexpected breakthroughs, say, eight weeks. Finally, he estimates a pessimistic time assuming that every anticipated setback that can happen does happen, except unexpected acts of God such as floods or fires, say, 20 weeks. These three time estimates, optimistic, most likely, and pessimistic, as mentioned earlier, are basic to the PERT technique. So then, we have established a range of uncertainty 
to complete this particular activity, a range of time from 8 to 20 weeks with the most likely time believed to be 12 weeks. By statistical calculations, these three PERT time estimates are translated into a time distribution curve, which we will see later makes it possible to determine the probability for completing the activity at any given time. Note that the most likely time represents the peak of the curve, and that the optimistic and pessimistic times are out along the baseline at opposite ends of the probability range. By further statistical calculation, Pert's three time estimates are translated into an expected completion time for the activity, which mathematically has a 50% probability of being achieved. Now let's consider the total area beneath the curve. A vertical line drawn from the baseline point on which the expected time falls will divide the total area into halves. Pert's expected time for completing a network activity may be longer than the most likely time as it is here. Or in other instances, the most likely and expected times may be exactly the same. Or the expected time may even be shorter than the most likely time. Whether shorter, the same or longer doesn't matter. The important thing is that Pert's expected times have a 50-50 probability of being achieved. Now let's see how these PERT times are used. When time estimates have been determined for every activity and event in the contractor's program, the information is coded for electronic data processing by Navy's Ordnance Research Computer at Dahlgren, Virginia. The NORC computer is programmed to process input data from all FBM contractors racing through thousands of calculations in minutes that would require man years of human effort. Thus, vital information is electronically computed and automatically printed out. Information essential for objective, reliable program management, rather than an I think this is what is going to happen basis for decision making. But exactly what kind of information do these PERT printouts contain? Let's examine some in detail. This is called a slack sort printout, one of several standard printout forms on which the events are identified both by number for computer processing and also by description for fast, easy identification. This slack sort printout not only points out the events in the critical path leading to a program objective, but it also points out where there is time to spare called slack. These are slack areas. Note that the printout shows scheduled completion dates for comparison with PERT expected times or outlooks. The listing of events ranges from those having the least slack, identified by these minus figures and zeros, to those having the most slack, identified by these increasing plus slack figures. The negative slack figures in this column indicate the number of weeks by which the total time of activities between events in the critical path will have to be shortened if the scheduled completion date of the end event is to be met. Here are the latest allowable dates by which each event in the critical path will have to be completed if the end event is to be completed on time. This is a time sort of the same events listed in chronological order. Completed events are listed first, the remaining events by expected dates of completion. This gives you a quick picture of what you can expect to happen and when. The event sort printout, showing the same data listed in order of event number, lets you readily associate event numbers with their nomenclature and expected dates of completion or outlook thus providing a quick means of relating computer information to the PERT network. In addition to standard printout forms, special printouts are available whenever required. This one lets you compare visually the expected completion dates of program events with their scheduled completion dates, either at weekly or monthly intervals, as much as a year in advance. 
Thus, using PERT, program administrators can size up the reasonableness of plans and schedules for getting jobs done by deadline time. Regular computer runs are made bi-weekly for each contractor's program. Copies of the printouts are sent to the contractor together with analytical statements which interpret the printout data and highlight work areas that require attention. Thus, PERT provides program managers and technical administrators with many kinds of information. Information tailored to fit the specific needs of appropriate levels of management and technical responsibility. Now let us see schematically how this PERT information is used. One important use is to identify events in danger of slippage along the critical path. In every complex program, there is one longest path in terms of the time needed to complete all the activities between time now and the end event. This path is called the critical path. But how can program managers locate the critical path of a complicated research and development program? This would be hard to do by paper and pencil methods, but using PERT, the process is simple and fast. As we have seen, the North computer quickly identifies every network event in danger of slippage and prints out the degree of danger in terms of zero or negative slack. When this information has been physically transferred to the network involved, the critical path is revealed as a red line. If completion time of the activities and events along this path can be shortened, the time needed to meet the program objective can also be shortened. How then does PERT help program managers shorten the critical path between time now and the end event? Most R&D programs contain work areas that are ahead of schedule. These we have seen are called slack areas because they have surplus time and often surplus resources in the form of money or manpower. Surplus resources can be transferred to activities and events in danger of slippage along the critical path. By such transfers, the scheduled completion date of the end event can be moved ahead with a consequent valuable gain in completion time. Program managers therefore have to answer two questions. First, where are these slack areas? And second, how much slack or surplus resources exist? To find out how PERT helps answer these two questions, let's examine a small segment of the network. The computer tells us we must complete all three paths to advance to end event number 12. Through event nine, PERT's expected time to complete the work is computed to be six weeks. Through event 11, the expected time is computed to be seven weeks. And through event number 10, the expected time is computed to be nine weeks. This nine-week path, being the longest in terms of time, is therefore the critical path. Now the computer determines that slack time exists here, and surplus time, slack, also exists here. Specifically, completion of event 9 can be delayed three weeks and completion of event 11 can be set back two weeks without delaying the target date of the end event at all. Having thus found out where slack exists in his program and how much slack there is, the program manager is now faced with a problem of selection. From which of these numerous slack areas will trade-offs of surplus resources gain the most time in terms of a shortened critical path. To help answer this question, the computer can simulate the effects of various possible trade-offs, thus letting the program manager know in advance which trade-off of many will yield the best results. In summary then, PERT communicates vital information about progress and progress outlook, information not readily available through human reasoning alone, yet information that is essential for effective planning and decision-making. Functionally speaking, and greatly oversimplified, it might be said that PERT is a management technique that results in effective nationwide collaboration among FBM weapon system contractors. 
program planning and evaluation groups within the Special Projects Office, and Navy's top-level management and technical direction staffs by means of high-speed electronic data processing procedures. Now schematically, let's watch the PERT system in operation. As FBM contractors make progress toward completion of their contractual tasks, their program managers send program upkeep information bi-weekly to Navy Special Projects Office. Here, the information is carefully checked, then forwarded to the NORC computer for electronic processing and automatic tabulation. The computer completes thousands of calculations at incredible speed, then automatically prepares a variety of standard and special printout forms. These printouts are routed back to the Special Projects Office for analysis and interpretation. When the current status of the contractor's program has been determined, special analytical statements are prepared and sent, together with the printouts, to all Navy and contractor personnel concerned. Printouts in merged and summary form with appropriate analytical statements are sent to SP's technical and management staff. Complete sets of standard printouts and analytical statements are routed to contractor technical and management personnel every two weeks. Thus, through a continuous interchange of up-to-the-minute progress data, the FBM weapons development program moves toward completion well ahead of schedule. Decisions for change in a contractor's program may result from the program manager's own evaluation. Or SP's management and technical direction staff, with concurrence by the contractor, may decide that changes should be made in the contractor's program. Or before reaching a final decision, Either SP or the contractor may decide to simulate several proposed changes through the computer. The resultant computer outputs provide reliable advance information about the effects of these proposed changes before they are actually made. On a basis of this advance information, decisions for change are made and carried out in the contractor's plans, schedules, and or performance specifications. In this way, PERT paints a single picture for all program administrators, thus assuring common understanding and effective action at all decision-making levels. Now that you've seen how PERT operates, let me explain how Navy uses the system to help coordinate major elements of the vast FBM development program. Obviously, for security reasons, this is not an actual PERT network but it is similar to one used in the development, design, and production of the second generation Polaris guidance system. A copy, of course, is used by Navy's Special Projects Office for overall program control. A copy is also used by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, prime contractor for guidance system design. Another copy is used by General Electric's Ordnance Department at Pittsfield, Massachusetts. GE provides industrial support for MIT's design effort. Similarly, a copy of the network is used by Lockheed's Missile and Space Division out in California, prime contractor for the Polaris missile. Bear in mind that this is not an exclusive MIT network, although prime responsibility for designing the Polaris guidance system rests with MIT. Nor is it exclusively a GE network, although General Electric actually produces the guidance system hardware. The point is that through PERT, MIT, GE, and other contractors coordinate and control their complex joint undertakings, communicating through a common language, basing their decisions on common computer predictions, expediting progress toward a common time completion goal. A similar coordinated and effective relationship exists in turn between GE and Lockheed. Looking ahead toward delivery of operational guidance systems to Lockheed, GE and Lockheed program managers coordinate their time schedules and target deadlines. Thus, through PERT programming of a complicated joint effort, Lockheed and GE avoid slippage along their interface critical path. Similarly, PERT makes effective communication possible between Navy and all major contractors associated with the FBM weapon development effort. The PERT system has now demonstrated its worth 
and large industrial organizations are now programming their computers for PERT data handling and reduction. Aerojet General has PERT programmed its 704 computer for program management and control. Lockheed, prime contractor for the Polaris missile, is operating the PERT system through its 709 computer for management and control. Sperry, major supplier of components for FBM submarines, has PERT programmed its UNIVAC computer. And the system is now being used in this major research, development, and production undertaking. Convincing evidence of PERT's value is found in the nationwide attention the system is attracting. It is being adapted and used in whole or in part by the other services, by government, and by private industry. Of course, PERT is not a panacea for all management problems, but as interest in the system continues to mount, evidence becomes strong that PERT constitutes a significant breakthrough in the management of complex, big-scale research and development programs.